Welcome to the Venture Fizz Podcast. I'm Keith Klein, the host of our show. In this podcast, we interview the most fascinating people in the tech scene. This includes lots of discussions with founders, investors, and operating executives. And do I have a great interview for you today. I interviewed Chad Lawrence, the founder and CEO of Simply Safe, one of Boston's latest consumer success stories that is playing in an even more difficult market, that being consumer hardware. If you're not familiar with the company, Simply Safe is disrupting the home security market, and they recently launched the third generation of their products at CES in Vegas. The company employs over 500 people, and they raised a growth round of investment from Sequoia Capital. If you haven't already, you'll probably start to recognize their national TV and print ads. Now, Chad has a very interesting story, and he shares a ton of the details on how he built the company, which was originally bootstrapped for a very long period of time. So there's a ton to learn from his story and success. By the way, if you're looking for new opportunities, make sure you check out Simply Safe's biz page, VentureFizz.com backslash Simply Safe, for all their job openings, or you can cruise on over to the VentureFizz job board, which has over 2,500 jobs across all functions and all levels of experience. So without further ado, here's my interview with Chad. Chad, I always like to start from the beginning. Uh, where'd you grow up and what did your parents do for work? Sure. Uh, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, so not far away. And uh, my my father um, uh, sort of followed in the line of, of uh, his father. Both both of them were entrepreneurs. Uh, my other grandfather was also an entrepreneur, so we have a, a lot of it running in the family. It's in the blood. Uh, my father's business was a, uh, a wholesale food distribution business. Uh, a lot of a lot of trucks trucks running around New England uh, distributing food. Okay. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, was a linguist. Um, she uh, was a, a school teacher and a translator. Got it. Okay. Um, I already gave a snapshot about Simply Safe, but I always like to hear it straight from the founder. So, what does Simply Safe do? Yeah, so we've developed a home security system that's disrupting the traditional home security market. Uh, so, with with us, you can protect your home in a matter of minutes. You can order it online. All the pricing is transparent. It's much more affordable. We'll send you a box. You can outfit your home in a matter of minutes and be protected that night. Uh, so we are we are disrupting the the traditional players like an, an ADT. Correct, got it. But going kind of back into your career, uh, you graduated from Yale with an electrical engineering degree, and then you started your career at Goldman Sachs. Correct. Yeah, that's right. I started in high tech investment banking, and then a couple of years in uh, in venture capital, uh, working with some of the early internet companies and and a few of the early uh, hardware Wi Fi companies, uh, folks like that. So, what do you think the uh, experience in, in venture capital? Uh, like, what do you think that was as far as building a foundation for your career and what it's led you to do today? Yeah, there were, there were a couple of really important things for me personally that came out of that experience that I think had a, a big impact on, on how we started Simply Safe and, and how we've operated the company. Uh, one of those is, uh, for, for me personally, it, it gave me a good grounding in business fundamentals, mm-hmm. in, in how a, a business model truly works, what the levers are, um, understanding, uh, you know, the basics of, uh, a PNL and a balance sheet, and and um, uh, you know how how to build a uh, sustainable um, uh, sort of well operated business. Um, the other piece it gave me was some insight into uh, into startups and into uh, what it means to be a venture backed company, uh, both the the sort of the good and the bad. And uh, I definitely got a first hand look at. Um, the, the benefits of having uh, backing and, and capital and uh, smart people around the table. Uh, but I also saw some of the drawbacks that when you're taking that money, you are generally signing up to try to scale really quickly. And it has some implications for some very important implications for how you're going to build the business. You're going to take in that capital and you're going to very quickly try to scale the business. And it doesn't leave quite as much room for uh, learning and experimentation at a smaller scale. Yeah, and the, the funding aspect of what you've built, we're going to talk more at length of that because I think sure. that's a very critical part to your story. Um, you decided to go back to, to B school. You went to Harvard Business School. Uh, talk about that experience and why did you decide to go the B school route? Yeah, that was a great experience. I, I had known for a long time that I wanted to start a company. And uh, in, in my mind, um, the early experience in venture capital, continuing through HBS was really all part of kind of education and preparing me to to be a, a startup founder and leader. Uh, HBS, the experience was great for, for two reasons. One, um, learned a ton from some amazing professors, learned some great frameworks 
uh, models for thinking about disruption that, that proved uh, super useful in, in building the company. Uh, and just as importantly, I spent two years surrounded by smart people writing business plans. And it was a great environment to put together the business plans, put together the ideas, test them, vet them with other smart people. And, you know, I think I wrote five or six plans uh, and, you know, they were varying quality and it was a great place to figure that out and then go and launch a launch a plan. What were some of the plans that you wrote about some other businesses before Simply Save? Yeah, I, I, uh, they varied pretty widely. I, you know, one of the plans was basically the business model for Hulu. And, you know, it's a it's a great business. I don't think the plan was bad. My conclusion coming out of it was I wasn't going to be able to do it. It wasn't the right plan for me. Right. And I do think that's, you know, that's one thing that uh, people sometimes maybe forget about when they're uh, writing a plan or going to start a company is it's not just how good the idea is and how good the um the plan that you write is, but, you know, are you able to execute? And that was one that I felt that I wasn't going to be able to ex execute on. When I finished writing Simply Safe, I felt like this, this plan fits not only the market, but it also fits me. And, and passion too, right? I think some entrepreneurs from what I've witnessed, maybe um, whether it's business school or not, uh, you know, just think about markets that need disruption, but they don't really have a connection where there's a personal tie to live and breathe it every day and have that motivation. How much do you think passion plays into a founder's story? I think it, 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 it's a critical piece of it because you're going to need to persevere. You know, this is, uh, it's, it's pretty rare that it's all up and to the right and, and easy. Um, there's generally going to be lots of challenges and you've got to have something that, that, um, that makes you um, power through those difficult times. I also think, um, you know, it, it should be, a, I, I have a, sort of a, a strong opinion that it should be something that you feel proud about and that you feel good about doing. Um, you know, again, it's not just can this idea work or make money, but you're going to, you're going to pour a significant portion of your life into this. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, at, at the end, it's not just about the financial outcome of it. There's a huge amount that you want to feel proud about what you've built. And, um, that's a big part of what, uh, what, what I, I feel about simply safe is that, um, I feel proud about the company and what we do. Um, it's, it's something that I feel like it's, it's you know, I've, I've poured years of my life into this and, and we've got something really meaningful to show for it. And, and you came across the idea for Simply Safe while you were wrapping up your time at HBS. So what was that moment that led you to discover this market that was ripe for disruption? Yeah, so I, there I was writing a lot of business plans and three of my friends got burglarized in the space of about a month. Wow. And yeah, it was terrible. And I kept having this conversation again and again uh, where they felt uh, traumatized and, and vulnerable. And it was this, this horrible moment in their life. And, you know, a very natural reaction is you want to do something about it. And they came to the conclusion they wanted home security. They wanted to get a home security system. And none of them did. And that was the striking thing to me. And it was for a couple... A couple of reasons. Uh, one w was that they were renting apartments at the time mm -hmm. and they called up the traditional home security providers and, and they basically just got hung up on that, that those guys weren't going to serve a, somebody in a rental apartment. Um, but even, even the guy who was owned his home at the time, um, you know, the, the dealer came over and gave him super hard pressure sales tactics with a very expensive contract that ran five years long. And, um, you know, it was telling him things like, you know, uh, you know, I, I see you got, uh, I see you got kids and, you know, if you want them to be protected, you got to sign this right now. Otherwise my guys can't come back for a month. Oh my God. And just left such a bad taste <laughs> wow. in his mouth. I was hearing this story and thinking, okay, this, this, this sounds like a market that should be disrupted. You, you shouldn't have to ask for permission to secure your home. You should be able to do it yourself. Right. Um, and I had that background of working with tech companies and some wireless tech companies and, and, um, it became clear to me that no one was doing this and that. Um, that this was something that that really could and should be done, that that we could put together with the right technology and the right product design, we could put together something that you can install yourself and get really great effective protection. I thought that was a big piece of you changing the game, the portability aspect. Before, they would have to come into your home and hardwire a home security system with keypads and put holes in your walls with wire sensors that are dug into your window frames. So it wasn't exactly do-it-yourself nor portable. So how did you get to the point where a security system should be a do-it-yourself project and portable? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is there was a time where that, that was necessary and it was the right answer. And there was an art to snaking a wire through the wall to the right place. Um, that, that time was now, you know, over a decade ago. I think, you know, now uh, what, what really struck us as we started writing out the business plan and, and designing the product was um, 
with the right technology and the right product design that you don't need that anymore. And it's actually, it's actually better if you install it yourself. Mm -hmm. You can think there are, there are, there are lots of things we've learned over the years that it's better when you do it yourself. Um, I think a lot of people, for example, find buying an airline ticket on uh, kayak.com, for example, is a better, easier process than calling someone up and talking to a travel agent or a, you know, someone at an airline. It's easier just to see it all there on the website in front of you and choose the one at the best price time point that you want to travel, right? Yeah. This is the same way. It's actually just better. You, you, you don't have to wait around for a technician to come. You can very easily install this in your home yourself. Um, it's empowering to do it yourself. You're actually taking control of your security. Um, you know your home better than anyone else. It empowers you to easily change and grow the system um, as, as you and your house and your needs change. So you know, if you do a renovation and you've got a new glass door in the back or something like that, you don't have to spend a couple hundred dollars to have somebody come back out and add a new sensor there. You can call us up and for $15, now you've got that point protected as well. It's really empowering. It, just cha it changes the game to be able to do it yourself so easily. Now, what you've been building is two businesses. I'm going to break them up into two categories, hardware and consumer. Both are incredibly hard businesses to build and scale. So taking the first one, hardware, I am fascinated by anyone who builds a physical product. There's so much that goes into the actual creation of that physical product. You have to establish things like manufacturing partners. So when you were building your first prototype, was it you and your house? You have an electrical engineering degree, so you have that background. But how do you go about building a first-generation product of hardware? Yeah. I mean, in the early days, yeah, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't the garage uh, startup, but it was the kitchen counter start startup. Sure. And yeah, it was a soldering iron out on the, the kitchen counter, uh, you know, building hardware. Um, yeah, I, I worked with uh, some consultants and vendors and, and um, you know, did, did a fair amount of work myself. And, and it was fortunate to have that background in electrical engineering and software to be able to do some of it myself. Um, and that was, it was, those were fun days. I mean, that was really, uh, it was hard and it was a lot of, you know, a lot of late nights and long weekends. Uh, but yeah, we were putting the, the first generation together. It was a lot smaller than our system is now. Um, but it was the beginnings of, of what was to become a very comprehensive, effective security platform. Um, you know, now we have a huge engineering team with, uh, awesome engineers who are able to do all that stuff, you know, better, faster than, than I was able to on my own. But um, yeah, I mean, I think when you're when you're starting a hardware company, you it's, you you definitely have to realize know what you're getting into and know that that hardware definitely has its challenges. And the manufacturing piece I've heard has been a major prohibitor for other companies where you know you got to find partners, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. the partnerships work out incredibly well, and sometimes they're false starts and just all these financial issues that you run into trying to scale the delivery demands. Yeah. I think you can you can definitely run into trouble with with uh, getting from prototype to manufacturing. Um, it's something that we we've got the battle scars from over the years of of you know having problems, making mistakes, having to uh, scrap inventory that was produced wrong. Um, you know we've had the benefit of great partners and um, you know who've helped us um, you know lear learn how to execute really well. Uh, but but even when we haven't uh, you know had had um, you know, we've had some partnerships that didn't work out perfectly, and, and I think that's part of being a, a hardware startup entrepreneur is that you have to, you know, persevere through those challenges, learn from them, and, and uh, you know, move on. And, you know, always make sure that you don't, uh, you don't, you know, bet the company or, or um, you know, uh, risk, risk your business over them. You have to be prudent. Let's tackle the second piece of this, the, the consumer side. Uh, building a consumer business is incredibly hard, too. Uh, instead of selling your product through retailers, you went direct to consumer. Uh, what was the thought process behind that decision, and how did you initially get in front of consumers? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing about a consumer business is uh, to make sure that you are uh, being customer focused and customer driven. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think there can often be a challenge, particularly in a technology company, to start with the engineering and start with the technology mm -hmm. uh, and figure out what, uh, what consumer problem you can hope to solve with that. Uh, in my mind, you know, part of what has set us apart has been we've been maniacally focused on what the customer's problem is uh, and then finding the right piece of technology to solve that. And so, uh, you know, if you go back to what we were just talking about, seeing what my friend's experiences were directly led to the design of the business and to the design of the product. Um, Did you do further we market on, research too? Did like a ton of market, ton research. Of market yeah. research. Yeah. So yeah. We, we went out and talked to a lot of people. We did lots of one-on-one -on -one interviews, in-home visits, customer surveys. Um, to really hone in on, you know, 
what is it people want to do to protect the home? What, what problem are we going to be solving? If we do this, you know, are we going to be solving their problem right? Really testing and, and vetting that to make sure that we were designing the right product. You know, again, so to, to harken back just a second to the hardware um, challenges, uh, you know, in, in a purely software company, um, you can probably be a bit more agile and, and adjust uh, to new market information than you can in a hardware company. Right. I think in a hardware company, it's even more important to get it get it right up front um, uh, because it's going to be hard to, to change too quickly. So, um, so yeah. So con uh, in a consumer business, I think really being uh, you know focused on the customer problem and how you're solving that is really important. When you've done that, then I think um, there's a number of ways of, of of getting to market, and there's there's no one right answer. It, there's it's going to vary depending on the business and the the economics of of the business that you're in. Um, but you can you can certainly start with um, uh, you know activities uh, by generating PR, uh, generating word of mouth. Um, you can do uh, you know the obvious digital uh, marketing activities such as search or Facebook advertising. Um, you know um, didn't didn't exist as much back when we were starting, but search was certainly uh, a great market to to start in. Um, again, it's gonna it's gonna depend on what you're producing. If it's something that people are already searching for, search is gonna be you know probably one of your best first. Uh, tactics for getting in front of consumers. If it's a totally new segment and people don't even know to search for it yet, you're going to have to find some other activity. It might be more PR that generates the awareness first that's going to, to bring customers in. Um, you know, for, for us, it, it definitely started with PR, word of mouth, and search advertising, and, and then branched down into more digital than offline activities such as podcasts, radio, TV, direct mail, um, awareness generation activities. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's there's retail distribution, which um, you know, is, for some businesses might be the uh, a better distribution vehicle than going direct to consumer, like like we predominantly have. Uh, for for others, uh, direct to consumer might be the the best um, best way to reach your customers. So, I think you know the the general the, the sort of the top level takeaway is to to, to understand your customers, uh, understand the problems that they need to solve. And try to understand how they're going to go about solving them. And that, that's where you get to the how are you going to reach the, the customer? If, if they're, um, are they going out and searching for it? Is this a new category? Um, is it, you know, is it something that should sit on a shelf in, an, in retail next to other, pro other like products? And that's where they're going to discover it. Um, if you really are approaching a customer first, I think that leads you to a lot of the, the right answers there. For customer acquisition, you used other alternative vehicles like the ones you just mentioned, uh, podcast, radio ads. But how did you come up with those ideas? Um, they're channels that people probably wouldn't normally think of. And ultimately, how effective were they? Yeah, so as a, as a direct and consumer marketer, we're very data-driven. Uh, and so we have a test and learn uh, mindset in all of our activities. And uh, that was that. So it was. We ran tests and we iterated and found which uh, which activities worked the best. Um, that those were some of the first that we rolled out online. They were um, lower upfront cost. So when we were in that bootstrapping mode, where um, we were very careful with our dollars, um, we didn't we didn't dive into TV advertising, which had higher upfront production costs, uh, a little harder to track. Uh, we went into the first offline media that we wanted to test was was radio and podcast because it was easier to track and and lower production costs upfront. Um, once we proved out that offline media, we added TV, uh, which has been extremely effective. Uh, it's got higher upfront costs, but once we proved that this offline media was working, it was easier for us to commit the dollars needed to make TV work. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. Boston has such a reputation for not being able to build consumer companies here. Yet, when I watch HGTV, I feel like every other commercial is a Boston company. Uh, Wayfair, Care.com, Simply Safe. But I guess that's a tangent for another day. But you talk about being scrappy and bootstrapping. Um, I think that's an important trait for entrepreneurs to understand. So how did you bootstrap Simply Safe originally to the point where you had built a profitable company and then you decided to raise what I would uh, guess is more of a growth round of funding from Sequoia? Uh, yeah, so I think it's all, all great questions. Uh, and I mean, the, the first point is, you know, bootstrapping, I think, can be a, a great choice for starting a company. It's obviously not always the right choice. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the first thing is the decision, you know, do you want to bootstrap the company or not? Is it, is that the right choice for for your business? Um, you know, the decision making process on on uh, on our part was that uh, this was a sleepy industry that was not moving quickly, uh, and that uh, we we saw that the the day would come when 
uh, we would hit an inflection point and you know we thought a lot of the world should be self-installing alarm systems um, but we didn't think that that was going to come quickly so we didn't think it was a, a land grab in those early years um, and I think that, that proved to be right uh, and we didn't see things like network effects uh, in in the in the model where you needed to build up two sides of a network and whoever built up those sides faster would would win and it would be kind of a winner take all um, so there, there were certainly some dynamics we saw that, that said that this is a business that you can bootstrap. Uh, and then we, part of the reason that, you know, that further reinforced that we thought we should bootstrap is we thought that there was going to be a fairly substantial um, iteration period of, of testing and learning and getting feedback from customers and building more. And we wanted the, the time and room to be able to do that at a smaller scale. Uh, and that's, that piece is, can be incompatible with venture capital funding, which has high return requirements. Uh, and so when you're when you're accepting those uh, venture capital dollars, you're generally signing up to try to um, go big fairly quickly, uh, and that we didn't think was going to be the right path for for this particular business. So then you decide, okay, this this there's some benefits to it, um, and, and there are other side benefits that come along as well. I think being resource constrained can actually be uh, a significant benefit uh, in a startup. Uh, those constraints can actually really make you focus on on what's most important. And I think in those early years, those constraints really made us focus on our customers. Um, we we were we didn't have investors to be investor focused on, so we didn't manage to investor milestones or what investors needed or said they needed or wanted or thought they they should see in the business. We purely managed to what our customers told us they needed, uh, yeah. and that was um, I think that was very meaningful. And I you know if you there are other folks who started a similar time to us, similar business concept, self-install security, who raised $30, $50 million um, and, and did not succeed. And I, I think part of it comes back to the, um, you know, the, those things we were just talking about. I think bootstrapping actually significantly helped us design the right business. Actually executing on it is then the whole other part of it. Uh, executing on a hardware, a resource-constrained business that's, that's also a hardware startup and direct cons to consumer um, definitely strikes some people as a crazy idea, um, and and I you know not not something I necessarily recommend if you want to keep all your hair. Right. Um, but it's uh, like I said, I think there were significant benefits to it, and um, you know you get the right team together, um, you get you get a little bit lucky, and um, and it, it it can certainly work well for the right business. Uh, anytime you start seeing success, I'm sure you get some inbound inquiries from investors wanting to provide you with capital to accelerate the growth of your business. At what point? Did you decide it was time to raise? And you know, what was the, you know you had a background in venture capital, which I imagine was helpful when you mm -hmm. were negotiating from the term sheet the final deal. Like, how did that all come together? Yeah, so so we'd um, we we'd been profitable for several years. We'd uh, started getting some significant traction in the market, and right around uh, kind of 2012, 2013, we started taking a step back and and saying we see the inflection point coming now. We've built a great product. We've got Happy customers who, who love the product, love the service, are, are passionate, engaged, and, and emotionally attached to the product. So we've really got something here, and the market is getting ready for this. Right. So, um, so we saw that inflection point coming, and the decision to, to raise capital at that point was really, we want to make sure that we're being as aggressive as possible. We, wanna, we don't want to fall into a trap of making conservative choices for the business. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we're going after all the growth, because we see... You know, now, five years from now, we think most people should be self-installing a home security system. It's, it's just better, less expensive, uh, less hassle, lower friction. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's the future of, of new installs. So we want to make sure that we've got the uh, team scaled up. We've got the new products developed, that we're investing in the, the right marketing and the right brand um, development so that we can uh, continue to own that market. I was watching a, a video from your uh, third generation product uh, from the Consumer Electronics Show, and uh, you had a, a setup where there was a mini home and you had the security system set up. And what I noticed is how far you've come and how slick the new system is. And it's, I, I heard you worked with IDEO to help design it. We did. Yeah, we have, have a great partnership with IDEO with their, with their local design studio uh, over in Cambridge. And uh, they, they've been great partners. Uh, I think together we designed a security system that's really uh, beautiful in your home. And there was, there was a lot that went into the design philosophy behind the system. We, we spent a lot of time with customers, again, understanding how they want it to fit into their home and really came to a conclusion that 
a lot of what a security system should do is, is melt into your home and be practically invisible. That the sensors, you don't want to constantly be reminded that you've got security sensors all around you and feel like you're in Fort Knox. You want those sensors to be tiny, tucked away, to be, you know, if, if you look on that tiny house video, you, you may notice that when we were giving tours at CES, the, the, we'd point out the sensors and, and the people we were pointing them out to would say, wait, where is it? Oh, okay, now I see it over there. And that, and that was, that's the whole idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, some components like the, the keypad, they're quiet when you're not using them. They have a dead front design where they're not all lit up and blinking and buzzing at you. But as you approach and, and we have this touch to wake feature where the whole thing lights up, uh, the, the high res screen turns on um, and the, the backlit buttons turn on and guide you through using the system when you're there. It's, and it's, it's a sort of a very high tech um, touch point. There's a lot of technology in there helping to keep you safe. Uh, and that's that's part of the design of, of the, philosophy, the design philosophy of the system. And it just seemed like there's so many different options to configure what is best for the consumer based on their home setup and what they truly care about, where they want to have that extra level of security or the base package. Or... Yeah, absolutely. And it's and it's one of the things that we've learned over the years is that um, it's really important to have that comprehensive security. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've we've built out over the years, um, you know, not just intrusion, but panic alarms, uh, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide, water leak detectors, freeze or high temperature alert sensors, uh, cameras, um, you know, glass break sensors that we've really added to the whole whole product line. Um, can, uh, the outdoor cameras are coming with the both outdoor and, and doorbell cameras. So it becomes a very comprehensive platform for knowing exactly what's going on in and around your home and, and making you safe. Another key piece to your business model is that consumers don't have to lock into a long-term contract. Is that what the market research told you, that uh, consumers don't want to be tied into long-term contracts? I mean, people hate contracts, and I think they're I think they're bad for businesses. I think they make for kind of sloppy, lazy businesses. So from, on, on both sides, I, I think I think it's made us a stronger company for a lot of reasons. One, um, yeah, customers hate them. It creates a lot of friction in a purchase. Uh, so now you're, you're not just buying, you know, this this um, this particular hardware with a little upfront investment. Um, you're also thinking through three, five years down the line. Is this going to be the right thing for me? Am I going to be still living here? Mm -hmm. um, so so that's that's bad for the customer. And so we we, you know, with that customer first focus, reject that. And then from a business standpoint, I think it makes you lazy. It, it, you know, if, if you if you know that you're going to be getting paid every month, no matter what you do, your incentive to provide good customer support, um, you know, great uh, ongoing product development, it diminishes. Uh, and so uh, we, we believe that it's good to keep ourselves on our toes. There have been times when uh, we've grown quicker than anticipated and our customer support line gets overrun and the hold times get too long. And we feel it and we immediately react to that. And you know, we hire people as fast as we can and make sure we're taking care of our customers. You know, with a, with a locked in contract, we might say, ah, you know, it doesn't matter. This will pass. We get paid anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the, the, the luxury of that. So it, it keeps us keeps us working hard. Um, what are you, what are your, you know, for first time founders, what are the, uh, points of advice that you'd give first time founders when, when starting to, to build a company? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, I think, I think some of the, the more interesting lessons to me as a sort of a general lessons of, of entrepreneurship are, um, watch out for, for internal biases and, uh, um, some sort of classic classic mistakes you can make like sunk cost mistakes mm -hmm. if i look back to some of the mistakes that i've made particularly early on uh would be something like you know hired a vendor uh it was supposed to be a six-month engagement and a month or two in i realized this was not going well mm -hmm. they were not going to hit the six-month timeline it was not going to be what i wanted they weren't doing enough work we missed you know something was really wrong but you know, I, I had that that sunk cost feeling of okay, I'm two months in. If I if I cut this contract off, I now got to get another vendor up. I've lost the two months. Maybe I've lost some money. Let's just let's just make it work. Mm -hmm. And then you know, in those cases, what happened more often than not was a year in, uh, we still weren't where I wanted to be, and uh, now I'd lost a whole year, spent a whole bunch more money. Uh, maybe maybe we muddled through and made it made it work in the end, or maybe I actually had to cut it off and go find a new vendor. Um, but if you know, if I if I thought, you know, written off that sunk cost and say, you know what, we just got to, we got to start over. Um, I probably would have been done in the six months. So make decisions uh, faster. Like yeah, learn faster, you know, and that could be with hiring a vendor. It could be with employees. It can be with, uh, you know, strategic direction of the business. Um, you know, that's not to say that you shouldn't have perseverance and grit and, and kind of work through problems. 
Uh, but when you when you identify that something's not working, you know, um, write off the sunk cost and and put that out of your mind and and make the right decision for where you are now. Yeah, more times than not, it doesn't work out. That's right. Like you might believe if you put that, like I said, the grade into it, but most of the time it doesn't. Your your gut's a powerful thing. What's your What's your biggest challenge these days running a a company the size of Simply Safe and like what keeps you up at night? Yeah, I mean, I uh, so I, I, I first I sleep pretty well at night. I think we've we've built a great company. Um, we've got a we've got a strong position. We're we're well capitalized. Uh, we've got um, you know we protect two million people now. We're one of the largest home security companies in the in the country. We're the fastest growing. Uh, so I think we're in a in a great position. I think the the thing we're really focused on is making sure that we. Um, continue doing what we what we've been doing and and don't squander this opportunity we've got the opportunity uh, to truly make a difference for tens of millions of people um, and and that's powerful to us and that that drives us every day and we don't want to squander that opportunity so the, the things that we're really focusing on now are are you know we're always working on scaling the team so we're we're hiring in you know across the board in engineering product marketing, operations, customer support. Uh, we've got we've got lots of hiring going on. And, and that's one of the hardest things to do is to continue to um, fill, uh, you know, great people into into the right role. Um, we spend a lot of time working on that and thinking about that. And um, we, we continue to hold a very high bar for for what it means to work here. And so that can make it challenging. Um, so so that's one of the biggest things is, is getting getting, the, you know, the right people. Um, and continuing to innovate, so we are, uh, you know, we're super excited to release our next generation all new Simply Safe platform. Uh, but we're obviously not stopping there. So we've got a lot more coming, and uh, that's the, the the big thing that we need to do is to we've we've got a huge lead in this market where we've been we've been doing this for ten years now in a way that no one else really has. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're you know feel confident saying that we're the best people at at protecting your home with a self installed alarm system. We need to keep um, extending that lead, and so we're, we're you know working hard on new products and uh, new services, and um, you know continue to make our customer support even better. Must be interesting to reflect when you start out with a vision, a business plan, and to see how far it's come. How many employees do you have now? Yeah, we're over five hundred employees now, growing growing pretty quickly. Two million people, two like million, two million, two million people. Yeah, that, like that's amazing scale. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I, I'd say, uh, I, you know, if you'd asked me ten years ago, you know, would we get to that level? You know, it would have been uh, I, I would have been uh, pretty pretty excited to hear about that. <laughs> so, what are you most proud of? You know, I, I think I'm most proud of the the um, the, the two million people we're protecting. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, as as a reference at the beginning, I think it's really important when you embark on on starting a business that you build something that you're going to be proud of uh, because you're going to put so much of your of your heart into it. Um, and it means a lot to me. I, I, uh, I get these letters every year from customers who um, tell us about what Simply Safe means to them and how it's changed their lives. And um, you know, at, at, uh, at the holiday party each year, I read some out to, to the to the whole company because I think it really uh, it makes a difference to all of us here that we are making a difference in people's lives. And so you know, this year we had people say that you know we'd saved their lives, that, that, um, that there was a fire in their house and we'd saved their lives. I've had, um, you know, folks write in and say, uh, you know, that they're a single mother, uh, who was having a problem with a stalker and, and, uh, you know, they, they couldn't sleep at night and never thought they could afford a home security system. And they found out about us and now they can sleep at night. And that's just, you know, made all the difference for them. And, and that's what motivates us. And we want more, we want to do more and more of that in the world. Yeah. No, that's very powerful. Um, what other, Companies in the Boston tech scene, do you uh, think highly of, or ones that you admire? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited to see the the sort of the, the growth in the Boston tech scene. I think for me in particular, um, I, I love what the guys at Wayfair are doing. I think uh, they they similarly had a, a bit of a, a bootstrap story, and uh, so I've got a soft spot in my heart for that. Uh, but I also just think they've executed incredibly well, uh, and I think that's I think that's yeah great for them uh, and and great for Boston. Yeah, absolutely. What's the future look like? So yeah, we are. We're our, our mission is every home secure, and we are we are working hard at that. So I think both domestically here in the U.S., we are introducing new products, more products to um, secure uh, 
more and more people. So we, we believe that everybody in this country should have access to home security, and, and that's what we're doing. Uh, we're also going international. So very soon we'll be launching our first international offices over in Europe. We're starting in the UK. Um, and so we're, we're excited to, to bring what we've been doing at Simply Safe you know, here in the US. We're excited to bring it to the rest of the world. Well, this wasn't meant to be a radio spot, but certainly if you are considering a home <laughs> alarm system uh, for you know, protection, definitely consider Simply Safe. It's a very slick system. Check out their uh, latest products. And the video I watched on YouTube with the demonstration was very powerful in terms of how it's all integrated. And, uh, you know, Simply Safe is a rocket ship. It's an anchor company now in the Boston tech scene. And as you highlighted, uh, the company's growing across all functions. So you can certainly, if you're curious about checking out job opportunities at Simply Safe, you can uh, certainly visit their careers page as well as their biz page on VentureFizz. But Chad, thanks so much for joining us uh, and sharing your words of wisdom. Obviously, uh, there's a lot going on here, so I wanted to get the, the story out there. Anything else, parting comments you'd like to, to leave? No, I mean, thank, thank you. It's, this is, uh, it's been great chatting with you. And uh, no, we're, we're uh, as you said, um, we're, we're excited to be uh, hiring lots of new folks. So uh, yeah, please visit the, the VentureFizz page or the, the Simply Safe page. And uh, we'd be excited to, to talk to folks who want to come work here. That sounds awesome. Well, Chad, thanks again for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, that's our show. I hope you found it useful and entertaining. If you did, please make sure you subscribe so you'll get future episodes. Also, please consider leaving us a five-star review and share this podcast with all of your friends and colleagues in the industry. It all really helps us out. Last but not least, don't forget to visit VentureFizz.com, the most trusted source for tech and startup jobs, news, and insights. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.